I'm David Courtney, a senior editor at Texas Monthly, and as part of our Bedtime Stories series, I'm going to read you a story. I've gone way back in the archive to um, February 1983, and I've chosen a story that I thought was appropriate, as we're all spending so much more time in our kitchens these days. So, uh, it's a story by one of the magazine's foundational writers. And uh, it's called, I Am the Greatest Cook in the World, and These Are My Secrets. And it's by Gary Cartwright, who posed for the uh, actual artwork there. That's Gary. When I say I'm the world's greatest cook, I don't mean chef. The word chef reminds me of some character in the Marx Brothers hangout at the Ritz. Zesoufle, you have make it go fall. I spit in the potage of your mother. Also, I don't mean I'm a cook like Richard Simmons or Graham Kerr or any of those other 87 cent phonies you see chopping cauliflower and hanging out um, and harping about nutrition on TV. I don't cook anything I wouldn't personally eat, and I'd rather eat a boiled tennis ball than cauliflower. Some other things I don't eat are zucchini, mushrooms, bananas, and anything almondine. I also don't eat mayonnaise. Miracle Whip is okay or put ketchup in my coffee. As for nutrition, I can look at my belt size and tell that I'm getting more than my share. Nutrition is something you worry about in East Calcutta or maybe Detroit. My taste buds were educated during World War II when America traveled on its stomach. Arlington, where I grew up, was still a country town. A couple of stoplights between the Lilliard Hog, hog Farm and the Eastern Star Home. My family enjoyed cooking, especially my daddy and my granny, and I enjoyed watching them because the kitchen was the most gregarious room in the house. Long after supper, the family used to sit around the kitchen table talking about Roosevelt and ration stamps and the day to come when butter would again be yellow. Well-being was a tub of iced beer, a bowl of chili peppers, and a pot of red beans simmering on the back burner. Daddy taught me to revere the lowly legume and respect the violent chili and to keep both handy. Granny taught me to wring the necks of chickens and singe off the pin feathers and to appreciate green onions, which cure colds, and zinc oxide, which cures everything else, and to abide by the cryptic message of Roy Acuff and the great speckled bird. You could, you could tell the days of the week around our house by what was on the kitchen table. Roast beef and chocolate pie, it must be Sunday. Monday was roast beef hash. Tuesday was ham and hominy. Wednesday might or might not be meatloaf. Late in the week, we'd have what was called BBF, balance brought forward, which was whatever was left over, done with considerable imagination. Saturday night was spent at the counter of Ms. Douglas's tiny cafe, a little greasy spoon beer joint across the tracks from Southern ornament, Ornamental Ironworks, watching the splendid little lady cook burgers. I love to play the pinball machine and filch corners of beer from the bottles of grand prize consumed in heroic numbers by the factory workers who gathered to play dominoes. Ms. Doug's hamburger secret, which became mine, was to use second issue meat, not the pale brown stuff that looks like dirty Crisco, but not the bright red stuff either. Medium priced, medium priced meat sizzles the second you splat it on the hot, well-seasoned grill. That's what she used. Everything must be sliced thin. The tomato, the onion, the pickle, and the meat patties should be pounded thin, too. Sour pickles only. And tomatoes that are slightly overripe. The lettuce should be loose leaf. The bun thin and small. The bun is grilled face down along with the meat, making use of the drippings, and in the final stages it's burned slightly on the top side. The warm bun is then stacked on top of the sizzling meat and pressed down with one final slap of the greasy spatula. This final slap and sizzle is a matter of faith. So is the manner in which the hamburger goes together. First, slather one half of the grilled bun with a lot of mustard. Lay on the lettuce, then the paper thin slices of tomato, salt and pepper at this stage, then the onion and pickle. Finally, finally the meat the other half and the other half of the bun. Ms. Doug immediately wrapped the burgers in sheets of wax paper. Paper towels will do too. Uh, paper towels will do uh, to seal in the flavors and serve them so hot 
you could faint just inhaling the aroma. No matter how many you ordered, a half dozen was barely enough for a 12-year-old. She cooked them one at a time, so they always arrived hot and fresh. There are other ways to cook hamburgers, though none with the perfect symphony of taste and texture achieved by Ms. Doug's creation. One acceptable example is the J.G. Mellon Burger, named after my favorite hamburger joint in New York. This is a thick patty of ground sirloin, grilled fast and rare and served on a toasted English muffin with Dijon mustard and a slice of purple onion. The other, worth, the other worthy is the specialty of a walk-up stand a couple of blocks from the Tarrant County Courthouse in Fort Worth. Famous hamburgers, I think they call it. What they do is pound some chopped onions into one side of the meat before grilling. The buns, of course, are grilled along with the meat and onions. The only condiment is mustard. Incidentally, if you don't own a well-seasoned grill, a heavy well-seasoned a heavy, well-seasoned black skillet will do. If you don't own a heavy black skillet, do what the French do, run for it. I was a freshman in college when I discovered that raw hamburger meat won't kill you. Steak hunt, I call it now. I was working as a dishwasher in a Colorado resort uh, called Trout Dell in the Pines. The chef Dell was a Norwegian bully who seasoned everything with anise and fennel. But the real artist in that kitchen was a gin-soaked short order cook named Foley whose steak hun with capers and anchovy kept me from starving and gave me new insight into the animal kingdom. Foley ground only the freshest, choicest sirloin, mixed it by hand with capers, chopped green onions, chopped peppers, Tabasco, Worcestershire sauce, Dijon mustard, fresh lemon juice, and egg yolk, and usually a few ashes from the unfiltered camel that always dangled from his lower lip. Served on toast and topped with an anchovy, it's one of the great delicacies of Western civilization. The secret of a good French fry <clears throat> is a red potato sliced as thin as a swizzle stick, blotted dry with paper towel, and cooked in hot grease until it sounds like gunfire when you snap it between your teeth. The trick for thicker sliced potatoes is to fry them twice, first in medium hot oil, then when the grease is blotted away, in very hot oil. Forget the ketchup, dip them in white vinegar, white wine vinegar. Another of my secrets is buttermilk. I'm told that buttermilk is an acquired taste, though I can't remember a time when I didn't love it. It's got to be fresh and moderately chilled. Taken straight, it's, ind it's indispensable for a hangover after a three-day drunk. And mixed with toasted day-old cornbread, chopped green onions, salt, and freshly ground pepper, it's far superior to yogurt. You can achieve the perfect crust for fried chicken by marinating the skin pieces in buttermilk for several hours prior to frying. Shake off, those loose, shake off the loose drops of milk and double dip the pieces. That is, dip them once, set them aside for about 10 minutes, then dip or roll them a second time in flour seasoned with salt, pepper, and a lot of grated Parmesan. Cook in sizzling hot vegetable or peanut oil mixed with a few spoons of bacon drippings. It'll make you sing and chop cotton. A buttermilk, with a, a buttermilk bath is good for any food that is battered and fried, such as oysters, shrimp, chicken livers, and the mandatory chicken fried steak. People who didn't grow up in Texas believe that chicken fried steak is a put-on, like those jackalope trophies you see in roadside souvenir shops. It's even possible, I suppose, for people born and reared in Texas to be suspicious of this ethnic creation. Witness that renowned fop, Larry McMurtry, who once wrote that chicken fried steak looks like an old piece of wood with the paint sanded off. For all I know, McMurtry has never eaten a real chicken fried steak. For all I know, McMurtry was born in New Hampshire, the illegitimate son of Noel Coward and Amy Simple McPherson. It is true that only about one out of every 96 chicken fried steaks prepared commercially can pass muster. It has taken me years to reproduce and perfect the stiff brown, uh, brown fried meat that they used to, serve at, used to serve at the Shorthorn Cafe on the campus of North Texas Agricultural College in Arlington. Start with ground steak, trimmed of all fat, get the butcher to run it through the ten, his tenderizer or do it yourself by pounding the flesh with the blunt edge of a knife blade. Give it a short soaking in buttermilk, not more than 20 minutes or it will 
fall to pieces in your hand. A true chicken fried steak is double dipped in seasoned flour, but an interesting variation is the country fried steak, which is prepared with a single dusting of flour. Either way, cook in very hot oil until pieces are crusty and dark brown. Fried chicken or steak should always be served with a, with a lot of cream gravy. Basic browns and whites. Basic, basic browns and white, author Dan Jenkins called, calls them. Jenkins doesn't eat anything that is not brown or white, or that still has eyes or legs. The way I prepare cream gravy is to do what Jenkins would do in the same situation. I yell for my wife. This is her method. First, drain the cooking oil and scrape away most of the glaze from the bottom of the skillet. Return six tablespoons of drippings to the skillet and make a roux by stirring and browning six tablespoons of seasoned flour. Slowly add milk, about one and a half cups, stirring constantly until the gravy has a free-flowing liquid consistency. Keep stirring over medium heat until it thickens, which won't be long. Salt and pepper it. Gravy is always served with biscuits, also with slices of fresh tomato when available, and some, and some onions and cucumbers marinated about 15 minutes in heavily peppered vinegar. During the hot summer months, fresh okra rolled in two parts cornmeal to one part flour and fried in oil or bacon drippings is compulsory. Forget all the crap you've heard about dipping okra in egg yolk. Okra is born with all the sticky stuff it needs. Folks in the East have never heard of okra, a vegetable introduced by African slaves from seeds smuggled from their native lands. But Thomas Jefferson is said to have been addicted to it. Jefferson believed its absence in the diet explained the weakness of the British character. Like all good Texans, I have my own secret recipe for red chili. I buy a package of Wick Fowlers and follow the directions. State Agriculture Commissioner Jim Hightower suggested during the last election campaign that Governor Bill Clements complete a course in Spanish in order that he might become by ignorant. Sound advice. I lived for about six months in the small Mexican fishing village of Zihuatanejo, largely through the exercise of by ignorance. This is how I happened to learn to love the traditional fish salad, ceviche. It's made with lots of onions and hot chilies and is not for the timid. One Peruvian recipe I read recently advised, do not touch the eyes or genitals after handling chilies. More sound advice. I discovered ceviche one blistering hot day while drinking beer under a palapa near Zihuatanejo's grubby downtown beach. After every fourth or fifth carta blanca I drank, the old lady who ran the place served a bowl of chopped fish, onions, and peppers. I'm not wild about fish, but this didn't taste fishy. It tasted refreshing and made me believe I was on the road to long life and prosperity. I'd eaten several bowls before I realized that it was raw fish. Most of ceviche served in this country tastes like iceberg lettuce soaked in cod liver oil. But you can make the real thing yourself with, a minimum, with minimum effort. Marinate two pounds of fresh fillet, two pounds of any fresh fillet of fish in lime juice for four to five hours. Any firm body fish will do. Red snapper, bonito, sea bass, even octopus or squid. Drain off the lime juice and mix with a variety of chopped vegetables. For two pounds of fish, I use two or three ripe tomatoes, two onions, eight to ten fresh peppers, both bell and hot, a jar of green salad olives, a bunch of fresh cilantro, two tablespoons of olive oil, and black pepper. Allow the vegetables and fish to intermingle for a few hours before serving on a bed of lettuce or spinach with a slice of avocado. Refrigerated, ceviche will keep two or three weeks. I don't know about that. After that, take it to the lab and have it tested. The lime juice cooks and preserves the fish and makes it magic. It is worth reflecting, uh, it is worth reflecting on the fact that human flesh retains little, if any, vitamin C, while marinated fish contains it in abundance. If certain tribes of cannibals in South America had merely alternated rust rump of, rust, roast rump of missionary with a few bowls of ceviche, they wouldn't have gone belly up with scurvy. A good thing to serve with ceviche is tostadas or chicharrones, fried pork skins, along with a bowl of refried beans. This brings me to the subject of pico de gallo. The secret of secrets as far as I'm concerned. Loosely translated, pico de gallo means rooster beak. It's that green or red salsa found on most tables in Mexico. I always keep a bowl in the fridge. 
Like almost everything else in Mexico, the creation is devilish, devilishly simple. Throw some onions, tomatoes, tomatillos, bell peppers, hot chiles, and cilantro into a Cuisinart. Remove a few scoops as needed and add a little vinegar, replacing, replacing the remainder in the fridge. You can use the salsa in a hundred ways, on nachos with refried beans and goat cheese, on chicharrones with a squeeze of fresh lime, on eggs, on melted cheese, on ham, in cold soup. In fact, you can add some tomato or V8 juice and some lime, and it becomes cold soup. You can add more tomatoes, a little sugar, and some spices and cook up a good ranchero sauce. Or you can just eat it with a spoon when you feel, the, when you feel an onset of the vapors. A lot of writers don't cook, or at least don't admit it. Many of the authors who contributed to the Great American Writers Cookbook, brainchild of that famed Epicurean and literary gadfly Willie Morris, proudly confess that they couldn't find a kitchen with a road map. The only time I ever go into the kitchen, says John Cheever, is when I'm being chased out the back door. An annoying number of writers' recipes begin in this spirit. First, open a bottle of gin and consume the contents. Cooking is one of the best ways I know to break writer's block. The closest alternative is being staked to an anthill. There is something mindless and therapeutic and faintly atavistic about vanishing into a well-stocked kitchen. Most of the time, I'd rather cook than eat. The mere aroma of a pot of simmering beans can seduce me into believing that typing is fun, or at least bearable. My favorite is pinto, or what my family called red beans, because of the intemperate amount of chili powder we mix therein. There is a ritual to cooking beans. I'm talking about dry beans here that must, that must be observed. First, remove the beans from the package, shake them into the palm of your hand, and observe the uncommon number of rocks, nails, and un unidentifiable objects, which come at no extra cost. <clears throat> you, you may do this as you please. Wash the beans thoroughly. If I can remember, I cover the beans with fresh water and soak them overnight, though never longer than 10 hours. Beans soak up a prodigious amount of liquid, so the next morning add enough water to provide a good inch or two of cover before cooking. If I forget the overnight soaking, I bring the beans to a quick boil, cover, and allow them to sit for an hour before resuming cooking. This will tenderize the hell out of them. Sometimes I use a pressure cooker, even though cookbooks say you may be taking your life into your own hands. It's not a bad idea to take a walk while the pressure cooker is active. Better yet, take a run. The secret is in the seasoning. For one pound of beans, I season with, two with a two ounce jar of Mexine chili powder, a chopped onion, a whole lot of garlic, a chunk of salt pork, and plenty of black pepper. When I can find them, I throw in a few smoked jalapenos, which are sold by the kilo in most markets in the interior of northern Mexico, but are difficult to find in this country. A fresh jalapeno is a substitute, but a poor one, and will likely kill out-of-state house guests. As you are seasoning, bring the little beauties to a quick boil. Cover and simmer for five or six hours until the beans are soft enough to mush with a fork and the juice is dark red and thick. Check the liquid from time to time, making sure to add only boiling water. The finished product should be slightly soupy. Goes great in chili. Ooh, blasphemy. Um, the best thing about red beans is leftovers, which I mash with a fork as they are frying in three or four or more tablespoons of bacon drippings. Um, Mexicans call these refritos. Huevos rancheros are made by spreading refritos on a warm tortilla, flour is best for my taste, and topping with eggs cooked sunny side up so the yolk is still bright and runny, then with melted cheese then with either pico de gallo or thick ranchero sauce. Black beans are prepared the same as reds, only with much less chili powder. A couple of tablespoons is plenty. A few celery tops and smoked ham hock instead of salt pork. If you cook the blacks until the juice thickens and the ham falls away from the bone, you've got the makings of a great soup. Skim off the bone and fat and run the beans through a blender with a little red wine garnished with lemon slices or chopped cilantro or grated parmesan, or all three. Navy beans, called small white beans in most groceries, 
are not among my favorites, though they make an extraordinarily delicious soup. Wash and cook them as you would any other bean. Season with smoked ham hock, a chopped onion, and a sliced carrot. When the beans are well cooked, stir in these ingredients. Some chopped celery tops and a little chopped stalk. One chopped bell pepper, one chopped bunch of green onions, and a small potato diced. <clears throat> Add more water and cook over medium heat, stirring occasionally as the soup boils and begins to thicken. Finally, add a package of chicken noodle soup mix, two jars of pimentos, and a half a bay leaf. Tabasco is optional but highly recommended. Cook over medium-high heat for another 20 to 30 minutes until the soup is rich and thick. Skim off the bay leaf and pieces of ham fat and serve with cornbread sticks, buttermilk optional, and very cold, uh, very cold bottles of Czech Czechoslovakian Pilsner poured into slender tapered Pilsner glasses, compulsory. Finally, uh, a word about what I like to call the happy accident. No accident in the kitchen, short of catching your hair on fire, is without redemption. Here's where the spirit of adventure comes, in, comes strongly into play. While researching this story, for example, I invited several friends over for one of my specialties, fettuccine alfredo. After warming up on several bottles of very good and very cold Chablis, I accidentally boiled the Parmesan instead of the pasta. When I discovered my, my mistake while grating egg noodles, I knew that I'd had another happy accident. The problem was not the ruined fettuccine, but what to do with a half pound of hard-boiled cheese. I simply scooped it into a pie pan, added some allspice, topped it with a graham cracker crust, and baked it, baked it for several minutes. Served with raspberry sauce, it wasn't half bad. And that's the end of the story. Thanks for listening. Um, be safe, and we'll see you on the other side.